How do I get into ham radio? This one is a viewer request. And while some have done this topic, I've been asked to describe ham radio and what it is. If you truly want to understand what amateur radio is, then you have to go back to the infancy of radio. There was no formal amateur radio back then, but there was definitely amateur radio. The word amateur comes from amador, which means lover of something, lover as in enthusiast. And this is what you will find most active hams, note, I did not say licensees, are. They love radio. Most people love some of the technical aspects, at least, even if it's just figuring it out when the band is open to a particular place. It is hard to find a ham who doesn't have even a little bit of knowledge about how radio works, though. That said, it varies considerably, but the core of the amateur radio service is that people love radio and love learning about it. In the early days of radio, you have the early radio experimenters who were just figuring out radio. And they were the first radio amateurs, essentially. People like Marconi, Hertz, Faraday, and Maxwell get all credit. But you may not know that a dentist, yes, a dentist by the name of Dr. Marlon Loomis, demonstrated the transmission of signals through space with a galvanometer connected to a coil of wire in the ground that caused movement in another galvanometer 18 miles away. This account, like many historical accounts, is somewhat disputed, but this supposedly happened in 1865. The point being that ham radio is made up of ordinary people who do radio experiments. Some people like to say we are just another communications hobby, but when you see amateur radio in its entirety, you will see that it is so much more. For the first 12 years, amateur radio existed without any regulations. Of course, the Titanic sinking changed all of that because it was alleged that radio amateurs, those pesky hobbyists, ended up hampering rescue efforts. So the FCC and other authorities worldwide imposed license requirements and we got banished to useless frequencies. But we prevailed and amateur radio prevailed and grew. I have a video about that. Be sure to watch. Fast forward to today. What is amateur radio today? For one, we help out in times of disasters. There are lots of people who are thankful for what we provide to communities. And it may not always be first response. In fact, we are not first responders, nor should we be first responders. Rather, a lot of amateur radio emergency communications deals with logistics for disaster relief and health and welfare. A lot of people want to know if their friends and relatives are okay after a disaster, and ham radio facilitates that. During 9-11, we staffed shelters and we helped pass messages about supplies and other conditions. When I lived in New York City, we lost phones and communications infrastructure. So ham radio helped provide communications when we lost that capability. In the Caribbean, where I'm originally from, ham radio is often the only means of communication after a hurricane or other natural disaster. And as such, local governments have integrated amateur radio into their disaster response plans. Ham radio is also a great way to have a backup plan for when regular communications don't work. That said, if all you want is a backup plan, then maybe GMRS, FRS, or CB may be a better fit, but amateur radio can do that too, just so you know. Ham radio has also always had a close relationship with science, and in particular the space program. In many respects, we have been an experimenter's playground. Dr. Joe Taylor, K1JT, personal friend of mine, is a Nobel laureate who discovered radio pulsars and got into radio astronomy due to amateur radio. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak had encounters with amateur radio when they were younger. Jobs never got a license and Woz let his expire. However, their engineering mindset fueled by their amateur radio encounters partially led to their successful careers. In space, astronauts such as Owen Garriott and Yuri Gagarin were radio amateurs. Today, nearly all astronauts get amateur licenses before they go into space, so they can take part in amateur radio activities in space, so they can have a backup link to Earth. Radio amateurs bounce signals off the Earth's atmosphere, and if that weren't enough, we bounce signals off the moon too. We were also the first to launch private satellites, that is, not owned by for-profit corporations or governments, we are probably the only spacefaring hobby there is. 
And we make friends. We make so many friends across the world. I have friends on every continent that I've made through amateur radio. This promotes international goodwill so well that we even talk to royalty and world leaders on a first name basis. Can't beat that with a stick. And while not strictly amateur radio, we have passed messages overseas and allowed the troops to call home during wartime. This was done through an official auxiliary called Mars, which I'll talk about in another video. And the best part, we do this with simple equipment that often runs up batteries, no infrastructure, no internet, no nothing. Just two radios talking to each other, maybe with an assist from the sun and the ionosphere. And amateur radio is everywhere. We are in almost every country on Earth, remote islands, the United Nations, and even on the International Space Station. So you sound like you're interested. How do you start? Well, to begin with, you need a license to transmit. You don't need one to listen here in the United States, although in some countries you do. Here in USA, you need to take a test. Don't worry, it's multiple choice and the questions and answers are available ahead of time. There are many tools to study with, but I'll give you a few of them. And this is applicable for the USA, but I'll talk briefly about other countries later on. There are three classes of license in the USA, technician, general, and extra. The technician allows primarily local communication, although you can use certain bands that occasionally allow communications over longer distance. That's your beginner license. You can then upgrade to general, like my friend and co-host cat, W4DXY, who just upgraded to general. And the final level is ham is amateur extra, which basically makes you a ham radio god. Well, not really. You just get full privileges and never have to study for a ham radio license ever again. I talk about the benefits of this, and you can see another video somewhere up here. So the first one is the ARL. They have a beginner's licensing course on their YouTube channel. It's actually from fellow YouTuber Dave Kasser, KE0OG. You can also buy their book, which is good to follow along and take notes. If you want something a bit more interactive, you can try Ham Radio Prep. They do have a paid course with videos and animations, but their apps are 100% free. You can use the app to drill the questions, but if you feel you need to get instruction from them, you can pay for their course. Then there is hamstudy.org, which does a different approach. Their website's free, but their app is not free. It costs a few bucks. It's really, really reasonable. Once you've studied and you consistently pass the practice test, you can then schedule a real exam. But first though, you need to pre-register with the FCC and get something called an FRN. It's basically a registration number that allows you to conduct business with the FCC. It helps protect your privacy since by law, the FCC needs your social security number and it's better to have the FCC securely collected from you online rather than handing it to a stranger on a paper form. Once you're registered, you can go in person to a local session or you can take it remotely supervised. Many local amateur radio clubs offer exams and you can find a listing of them on the ARRL website. Remote exams are available from several clubs and became widespread during the COVID-19 pandemic. If you are uncomfortable going to an in-person session, wearing a mask and all of that jazz, you can schedule a remote exam. You will need a smartphone with a camera and a laptop, as well as a quiet, empty room. Some test teams charge a fee, but there are some that are free of charge. The free ones are usually in person. The exam team will ask you to fill out some forms, present a photo ID, and then take your test. With remote exams, you do all that all online. Once you pass, the team submits your exam to the exam coordinator and you wait. The FCC will process your application within a few days or a few weeks, and then you'll see your call sign in the database. Once your call sign is in the database, you can pick up a radio and transmit within your assigned privileges. There is no need to wait for a paper document in the mail anymore because the FCC doesn't even mail them out anymore. You will get an email from the FCC with a link to download your license. So that's the first step. In other countries, you can contact their National Radio Society, which I'll have a link below to find that. In Britain, it's the RSGB. In Trinidad and Tobago, it's Trinidad and Tobago Amateur Radio Society. In Canada, it's the Radio Amateurs of Canada, Australia, the Wireless Institute of Australia, 
in Germany, Deutscher Amateur Radio Club, EV, and so on. Beyond that, we'll talk about the next steps in another video in the series. If you found this helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, peace in 73.